You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached the age of 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hi, right, John. Well, thanks for uh, coming on the podcast. I really appreciate you, appreciate you being here. It's a great pleasure to talk with you, Richard, and uh, I, I really appreciate your interest in, in my book, Cosmos Sapiens, Human Evolution from the Origin of the Universe. Well, I don't want to be left behind evolutionarily, so uh, you know, it's, it's important to talk about it. So t- tell me, um, what prompted you to write the book in the first place? After my wife died from cancer, I, I began to ask myself, what are we? Where do we come from? Why do we exist? Now, these are questions, Richard, that humans have been asking for at least 25,000 years. Mm. During all that time, we have sought answers from the supernatural. About 3,000 years ago, however, we began to seek answers through philosophical reasoning and insight. Then, around 150 years ago, we began to seek answers through science, through systematic, preferably measurable, observation or experiment. Okay. The science graduate and former tutor in physics at the Open University, I wanted to find out what answers science currently gives, but I couldn't find any book that told me. There were two reasons for this. First, the exponential increase in empirical data generated by rapid developments in technology has resulted in the branching of science into increasingly narrow, specialized fields. I wanted to step back from the focus of one leaf on one branch and see what the whole evolutionary tree shows us. Second, most science books advocate a particular theory and and often present it as fact. But scientific explanations change as new data is obtained and new thinking develops. And so I decided to write the book that hadn't been written, an impartial evaluation as far as possible of the current theories that explain how we evolved, not just from the first life on Earth, but where did that come from? Where did that come from? right back to the primordial matter and energy at the beginning of the universe, of which we ultimately consist. Do you you feel like you reached any conclusions that um, informed you of anything new, or uh, is it just more questions without answers? Oh, no. Um, I mean, the book took more than 10 years to research and write, and it reached conclusions that surprised me. Okay, what what are some examples? Well, for example, I, I mean, I'd assumed that the Big Bang was well-established science. But the more I investigated, the more I discovered that the Big Bang theory had been contradicted by observational evidence 60 years ago. Cosmologists have continually changed this theory as more sophisticated observations and experiments produce yet more contradictions with the theory. Now, cosmologists call the latest version the concordance model. I Can think you- it's more accurate described as the inflationary before or after the hot big bang unknown dark matter unknown dark energy model it posits for example that 27 percent of the universe is something called dark matter but 30 years of investigation has failed to provide any evidence of what this dark matter is it posits that 68 percent of the universe consists of something called dark energy the 20 years investigation has failed to provide any evidence of, of what this dark energy is. For me, Richard, that leaves 95% of the universe unexplained. Yeah. And 
it, it gives no rational explanation of how everything bursts into existence out of nothing. It, it's central axiom that the universe inflated at a trillion, trillion, trillion times the speed of light in a trillion, a trillion, trillion of a second is untestable. Hence, it's not scientific. So what does, that, arise, uh, what, what does that leave you with, you know, with specifically first with the, uh, I bet you this has happened multiple times throughout the book. You, know, you looked into evolution, same thing. You looked into other things, but starting with, you know, the Big Bang or how the universe began, what conclusion were you left with about it? Well, the, let me say that the problem arises because these cosmological theories are mathematical models. They are simplified solutions of Einstein's field equations of general relativity applied to the universe. They are based on assumptions that the latest observations show to be invalid. Um, another surprising conclusion I came to when I examined the orthodox theory for the last 65 years in the UK and the USA of how and why life on Earth evolved into so many different species. I mean, it's known as neo-Darwinism and was popularized by Richard Dawkins in his best-selling book, The Selfish Gene. And this says that biological evolution is caused by genes selfishly competing with each other to survive and replicate. It's based on the fallacy of ascribing intentions to an acid, deoxyribonucleic acid, of which genes are composed. Now, Dawkins admits that this language is sloppy and says he could express it in scientific terms. I've read the book twice. He never does. Hmm. Moreover, it's a mathematical model which is contradicted by substantial behavioral, genetic, and genomic evidence. When confronted by such evidence, instead of modifying the theory to take account of the evidence, as a scientist should do, Dawkins lamely says, quote, genes must have misfired. Hmm. In fact, Richard, he, he couldn't modify the theory because the evidence shows that Darwinian competition causes not the evolution of species, but the destruction of species. It's caused the destruction of more than 95% of, of, of all species that have existed. It is hmm. collaboration, not competition, that has caused the evolution of successively more complex species. When you say collaboration, do you mean symbiogenesis, such as uh, you know a cell ingesting a bacteria to make a eukaryotic cell? Right from yeah, r right from th that part of combination there to combinations of well, go back even further, combinations of of, of atoms and molecules, uh, of atoms into molecules, molecules into the. The, 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 the stuff of life um, and, okay. and, and, and the combination of all these into cells and the combination of cells into tissues, the combination of that. But it's, it's um, m more important, you know, as, as we go on, this becomes, it, it, I mean, let, let me explain it in, in, in different stages. There's the competition, com competition the, the co collaboration that, that produces the evolution of inanimate matter, then we get a change when collaboration produces life. Um, okay, I gotcha. Yeah. So, and, um, uh, I guess and it sounds like in writing this book, you know, you ran up against tons of uh, presupposed notions about the biggest questions ever. I just wonder if at the end you found satisfaction or, or not, but... Um, I guess we'll continue along the uh, the big question line. It, it, people seem to be unique, I guess, in terms of their consciousness. Do you, do you believe we're unique after all the study and what makes us unique? Yeah. Um, I came to the conclusion that we are unique. What marked our emergence as a distinct species some 25,000 years ago wasn't the size or shape of our skulls or that we walked upright or that we lack bodily hair, or the genes we possess. Those are differences in degree from other animals. What made us unique was reflective consciousness. Now, consciousness is a characteristic of a living thing as distinct from an anim inanimate thing like a rock. This is what I said, that it stages, it reached a difference in kind when collaboration produced living things, and living things are characterized by consciousness. 
It's, so it's possessed in ruder, rudimentary form by the simplest species like bacteria. And in the evolutionary lineage leading to humans, consciousness increased with increasing neural complexity and centration in the brain until, with humans, it became conscious of itself. We're the only species, Richard, that not only knows, but also knows that it knows. We, re we reflect on ourselves and our place in the cosmos. We ask questions like, what are we? Where do we come from? Why do we exist? And chimpanzees are our closest relative, relatives genetically. But Richard, do you know any chimpanzee that asks questions about the purpose of life? Yeah, no, I don't. I don't know anyone. I know they can learn language and things like that, and they can communicate with humans, and, you know, they have their own family life and sophistications, but, I mean, I don't think anyone's seen that they're reflective about the past or the future or anything like that. Exactly. I, the the, the self-reflective consciousness has transformed existing abilities and generated new ones. It's conform, it transformed comprehension, learning, invention, and communication, which all other animals have in varying degrees. I mean, chimpanzees have them much more than, um, than spiders have them. But no, it, it, these increase. Um, but ours have been completely transformed. And it's also generated new abilities like imagination, insight, abstraction, written language, belief, and morality that no other animal has. I mean, uniquely, we've made the whole planet our habitat. We've cooperated to design and operate the Large Hadron Collider to investigate primordial matter and energy. We've sent spacecraft to investigate our solar system and beyond. And we've decided to overcome our aggressive instincts and to practice altruism. There's a possession of reflective consciousness marks a difference in kind, not merely, not merely degree from other animals. Just as there is a difference in kind between inanimate matter, like a rock, and living things like bacteria and animals. Moreover, Homo sapiens is the only known species that is still evolving. Oh, really? Okay. So how are we... Hopefully we're evolving in the right way. A lot of people say we're, we're de-evolving into, like, texting uh, <laughs> social media junkies. But, uh, you know, I'm just teasing. But, but are we still right. evolving, do you think, and how? We, we, we are. But our evol... Our evolution is not morphological, the physical characteristics, or genetic, but noetic. It is an evolution of the mind and has been occurring in three overlapping phases, primeval, philosophical, and scientific. Primeval hmm. thinking is dominated by the foreknowledge of death and, and the need to survive. Accordingly, imagination gave rise to superstition which is a belief that usually arises from a lack of understanding of natural phenomena or fear of the unknown. It's evidenced by legends and myths, the beliefs in animism, totemism, and ancestor worship of hunter-gatherers, to polytheism in city-states in which the pantheon of gods reflected the social hierarchy of their societies, to finally a monotheism in which other gods were demoted to angels or subsumed into one god, reflecting the absolute power of king or emperor. The instinct for competition and aggression, which had been ingrained over millions of years of our pre-human ancestry, remained a powerful characteristic of humans interacting with and dominating reflective consciousness. Okay. The second phase, the second phase of reflective consciousness, philosophical thinking, emerged roughly 1500 to 500 before the current era. It was characterized by humans going beyond superstition to use reasoning and insight, often after disciplined meditation, to answer questions. In all cultures, it produced the ethical view that we should treat all others, including our enemies, as ourselves. This ran counter to the predominant instinct of aggression and competition. The third phase of reflective consciousness, scientific thinking, gradually emerged from natural philosophy in approximately 1600 of the current era. It branched into the physical sciences, the life sciences, and the medical sciences. I mean, what's interesting, or what I found on what the sapiens shows, is that physics, the fundamental science, then started to converge, and rapidly so, over the last 65 years, towards a single theory that describes all the interactions between all forms of matter. I mean, according to this view, 
all physical phenomena are lower energy manifestations of a single energy at the beginning of the universe. I mean, this is similar in very many respects to the insights of philosophers of all cultures that there is an underlying energy in the cosmos that gives rise to all matter and energy. Yeah, that, kind, the of, uh, that kind of seems to go along with... I mean, I know, like you said, there's not the evidence for it, but I guess, yeah, it kind of seems to go along with... Uh, the Big Bang, this great energy that has now spread throughout the universe, but uh, everything is still a part of that original energy. Yeah. Um, it, it, I was struck by the similarity between where physics is now leading and some of the insights of, 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 of philosophers. Um, not that there's so much a Big Bang. This is more where the Big Bang theory has got more in common with the Judeo-Christian beliefs than it has with ancient philosophies, which talk about an existing, not a big bang, but an existing underlying energy in the cosmos that then gradually gives rise to all matter and energy. So it's not something that comes out from nothing. It is actually, it has always been there. Mm. Um, but, but picking up, I mean, the point before, a, a world physics, I mean, during the last 65 years, reflective consciousness has also produced an increase in technology that leads to a convergence in humankind, to globalization, a reduction in aggression, an increase in cooperation and altruism, and the ability to determine humankind's future. And the whole process of human evolution has been accelerating. I mean, primeval thinking emerges roughly 25,000 years ago. Philosophical thinking emerges about 3,000 years ago. Scientific thinking emerges some 400 years ago. While this convergent thinking begins barely 65 years ago. Oh, that's what I was going to ask you. So the latest is convergent thinking. And where do you, what, where do you think that we're headed as a species and over what time frame? What do you see ahead? Um, that you have to ask me when I finish the sequel to Cosmos Sapiens, which is called, provisionally called The Future of Humankind. I mean, Cosmos Sapiens takes us from the origin of the universe until now. And so you, you ask a very valid question about the future, and, uh, 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 and this is what, what, what I'm now asking and now investigating. Um, so what Cosmos Sapiens has shown, and I think what it uniquely shows, is that by a, a examining the evidence um, of our evolution from primordial matter and energy at the beginning of us, we see a consistent pattern. It shows that you know we humans are the unfinished product of an accelerating cosmic evolutionary process characterized by a combination, increasing complexity and convergence, and uniquely as far as we know, with a self-reflective agency of our future evolution. Do you think that uh, at some point soon humans are going to be able to create and shape life itself and maybe create AIs that uh, become, you know, self-aware and, uh, and sentient and then maybe merge with them? Is that our future or what do you think our future is? Um, as I said, Richard, what I think the future is, it, it's, it's something I'm investigating. I'm, I'm very careful and always have been you know, not to come out with a view unless I've thoroughly researched it. I'm researching this future at the moment. I mean, all I can say that all that's in Cosmos Sapiens is backed up by evidence. And yeah, it sounds like a fascinating book. I just, you know, we've got to know what's, what's, next, what's next for us. I mean, you know, I understand that you don't want to say things without proof or without evidence and all that, but can you just give a general idea of where do you think things are going subject to you verifying it? I think we're on the track to a, a difference in kind when we will, these processes will reach a stage when we'll reach another change of kind, when we will be transformed into a new species. And what will be some of the characteristics of that new species, you think? Do you think we'll still have our bodies as we have them now? Do you think, again, it'll be a, I don't know, will we become again, merge with machines? Like, what are, your, some, what are some of your thoughts that what may happen? No, I, I'm, I'm looking at, I mean, the, 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 there, there are various predictions about, um, you know, artificial intelligence and merging with machines and so on. Um, I don't, 
so far, I haven't seen any convincing evidence for this. Um, my feeling is, and I stress it's only a feeling, and I, I, I need to back this up further, is that um, we won't have bodies. We'll be disembodied. Our minds will roam free. But this will also won't be individual minds because most of the projections of the future concern individuals um, about how individual minds might link with artificial bodies and so on. Um, the trend I'm seeing is that it's the, by projecting ahead the evidence of our evolution from the origin of the universe, we will be converging as a species. So it will be a collective species, not individual parts. Well, I guess there'd be stages to that. I mean, now everyone or a lot of people are fiercely independent and they they prize that above all else. I can see us becoming a lot more collaborative. And then I guess the next stage from that is, you know, joint decision making and maybe like a hive mind. But I don't know. Do you really see people giving up their own sense of self and becoming part of the one? I guess you could say, you know, a part of this unified whole? Um, I think that is a very distinct possibility because of the great advantages it will give us. Um, we, in our, when we talk about the self, there are so many limitations to the self. Uh, in our individual, inhabiting individual bodies, how do we define ourselves? Do we define ourselves by, you know, the bodies we exist now? Um, what, just, just how do we define ourselves? And if we had the ability to, in a sense, you know, live forever and roam freely throughout the cosmos, if we had become part of a collective self, set that as an advantage against the advantages of being individuals, then I think that's a choice many people will make. Mm. Um I don't know if this is going back or going sideways, but what, what do you think happens then when, um, when someone dies? Where do they go? Do they go anywhere? I mean, what, what happens to them? I'm a complete agnostic on this. I do not know. And nobody knows. And anyone who says they know, um, I think is, um, it, it, it's a matter of, 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 of belief, but, but, but it seems to me um, completely... It, it, Irrational to be able to know. I mean, all the let's take. I, I, I was um, born and brought up a Catholic, um, and the Catholic Church teaches that the Pope, when speaking on matters of, of of faith, is infallible. And the last pronunciation that was deemed to be infallible was the Pope saying that the Blessed Virgin Mary rose bodily from the earth to heaven. Now, if she rose bodily from the earth, did she go, what altitude did she reach? Did she reach the orbit of the moon? Did she reach the solar system? I mean, it's, it seems, it's crazy. Uh, so anyone who says, you know, they know, I, I think is, is deluding themselves. Well, okay, um, do you think we'll ever know what will death look like in the future, or will it just be the same? So do we ever know what? Well, so do you think we'll ever know what happens when when someone dies, and what do you think death will look like in the future for people? Will it look any different, or will it just continue to be the same thing as we evolve? Um, I do not know, and this is what um, I I try and stress in, in, in Cosmos Athens that um, I will only offer an opinion if I've got a an evidential basis for doing so. I haven't an evidential basis for knowing what is going to happen after death. And so I do not know. All right. Um, since you've studied a lot of the past and you know, the origins of you know, the Big Bang and everything in our evolution, what about purpose? So if there was this tremendous energy that now became, uh, I guess, dispersed into all these forms and we're a part of it, what do you think is the purpose of all this? What was the purpose of what is the purpose of the universe and us and everything else? Uh, again, I do not know. I mean, what Cosmos Sapiens shows is what we do know, which shows this process of 
combination, convergence, complexification. This, I can say, I have the evidence for that, and it's in the book. Um, purpose is philosophical rather than evidential. Um, I do not know, and, and I think it's, it's, it should be indicative of, of thinkers and people who ponder this to come out and, if they do not know, to say, I do not know, and not to rely on necessarily what they've been told as a child and been brought up and inculcated with to question things. And where they don't know, to say that. Yeah, no, it's fine to say you don't know, that's okay. I just did I mean, how has your perception of um, of the world changed after all this research? Again, do you feel like life has purpose or is just an accident that it's here? Or do you think there is a guiding hand somehow? You're asking the same question, um, Richard. And I give you the same answer. I do not know. You ask me about the stuff in, in, in Cosmos Sapiens, and I'll talk about that. Ask me about the speculations of which is not an evidence, you know, and I, I, I will say, I do not know. Okay. Uh, sorry if I'm being unfair. Do you, do you feel more satisfied with the way things are after writing the book, or do you feel just, all right, I'm on to the next set of questions? No, I feel satisfied in that I understand so much more now than I did. I discovered things which I had, you know, as a trained scientist, a lot of assumptions that I made, um, many of them have been shown to be contradicted by the evidence. I mean, there's one chapter in, in Cosmos Sapiens, it's called um, The Limitations of Science. When I go into um, what are the limitations of science, because it, it, there's often among the general public a view that, okay, you know, People can have a different view, but but, but science is, is 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 hard evidence. You know, what, whatever science whatever scientists say is must be right because the scientists are guys who, who have all the evidence. But if you look at the actual process, there's a whole spectrum of things involved in there from um, deciding what to investigate, deciding what evidence to collect, selecting the evidence interpreting the evidence, um, then being challenged by, uh, and then coming up with a hypothesis, um, and then trying to confirm that hypothesis. And very often, um, scientists reach a mindset when they've invested so much of their time and energy into a, a, a particular theory or a hypothesis. They then become subconsciously extremely reluctant to accept any evidence that contradicts what they're saying. They've invested themselves in it. Um, and it's a confirmation bias. They will look for anything that confirms what they were saying, and they will often, in the later stages of their careers, ignore evidence that contradicts it. Do you think that there may be a danger that you know we're converging uh, intellectually, and if we converge upon these... Um these unfounded uh, quote unquote facts such as the big bang or these unfounded assumptions that, you know, uh, there won't be room for other thoughts or ways to go into the right direction and really figure things out. So it, it, I, I, I didn't quite understand that question, Richard. You know, I guess you were saying we're converging as a species. Um, yeah. So does that mean that there will be a, uh, a leader or leaders among the convergence that will steer where it goes? You know, what if the, the common belief or myth that, you know, that's left uninvestigated except perhaps by you and a few others, you know, the Big Bang, what if that stays and sticks and that becomes the, uh, you know, the dogma and the whole collective says, oh, that's what happened and just kind of continues along that vein and doesn't challenge that belief or that assumption? You think it's possible for well, that to happen or truth will win out? Yeah. No, I mean, the, the whole history of science is that um, theories have been put forward um, and they've been clung onto by the leaders in that field who built their reputations on it. But eventually, um, the contrary evidence builds up 
and the theory topples. I mean, this happened so many times in science. It happened with um, the the guy who challenged um, the, the the theory that um, how the how the Earth was formed, the mountains and craters, and so on, and he came out with the theory of tecton- tectonic plates, and he investigated this and got the evidence, and he couldn't even get published. The scientific community, you know, completely rejected it. Um, they said, "Well, we have our theory, uh, and it's this is our theory. Uh, that's it." But the evidence built up and built up and built up, and eventually the existing theory was toppled, and now science has adopted the theory of tectonic plates to explain how we get the mountains and rivers and and oceans and so on, and uh, how how the Earth uh, is structured. Um, So there are so many instances of... um, You go straight back to um, Galileo, when the theory at the time was the Earth was the centre of the universe. And anyone who came up with a different idea was was branded, you know, a heretic. Um, and yet that theory was clung on to uh, for so long. And, um, of course, it was overturned. You know, the Earth isn't the centre of the universe. Right. It's only just one one planet in the solar system, et cetera, et cetera. So there are so many instances of um, where the evidence does build up that it topples the, uh, the, the the then current paradigm. All right, no, that's good. That makes sense. Um, any feedback from readers that surprised you, or that uh, you know you really enjoyed or found value in? Yeah, the response of of, of the readers has 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 been terrific. Um, it's uh, that's one one very satisfying thing about this. Um, and also the response not just of readers, um, but of some of the leading scientists in in the world have responded. I mean, the, 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 the inside the cover has got endorsements from um, you know, a whole like list, list of, uh, of of leading scientists. Um, like Paul Steinhardt, Albert Einstein professor in science at Princeton, um, has endorsed it. Um, Tim Crane, a philosopher, a Knightbridge professor of philosophy at University of Cambridge, um, and, and and so on. So that's been very gratifying. Uh, that some of the scientists who just follow you know the existing paradigm and not thinking for themselves have. have uh, have, have, have questioned it, but the really bright, you know, scientists, the really big minds, um, have looked at it, and it, it was quite interesting with with Paul Steinhardt because I sent him a draft of um, uh, of, the, of a chapter in his field, and he and he wrote back and said, you know, this is this is nonsense, um, this is not what the current theory is, and I said, fine, you are the expert, I'm not. And can you tell me precisely what is nonsense about it? And we had an exchange of emails. And then I got this one email back that said, um, this, may, this, this, this may come as a great surprise to you, but actually I now agree with what you're saying. Um, so things like that are, are, are very satisfying. Okay, very good. So uh, the best way for people to get the book is... is I guess it looks like Amazon. It's available in paperback, Kindle, Audible, which is great. Um, any last thoughts um, in our talk that you want to leave people with? And uh, it, it sounds like a really fascinating book. I literally just downloaded an Audible, so I'm going to start off on it uh, shortly after this interview. But uh, any last thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 in the time we've had together, I've only, only been able to summarize some of the key findings. Um, but one of the reviews which I like, which says, I mean, I don't want the readers to think it's you know beyond them, because the Science Literary Supplement says it's limited and intelligible to non-specialist, a book mm. of astonishing scope. So you don't have to be a specialist to read it. I mean, I, 
I, I, I'd also, in, you know, in my past life, have written novels, and so it's although I've gone into it in detail, I, I, I hope the way I've expressed this is in a way that the um, the average reader can understand. Okay, well, that's good. Yeah, otherwise, uh, you know, it's not going to be accessible to a lot of people, and you know, if they can't read it, or you have to be a specialist. So that's good to hear. Well, very good. Uh, what's you know, in addition to the book, uh, do you have a website, or you know, how do we know uh, when your next next book is coming, or how do people reach out uh, with questions or to learn more about you? Yes, the website is www. John Hans, J O H N H A N D S dot com. And um, the website um, adds contact. So if people want to contact me, um, then they can do, through, do so through the website. And I, I always respond to the people who do. Uh, and many have. Um, so I, I, I'm delighted when I get you know, feedback from individual readers. All right, very good. Well, John, thanks for coming and spending the time. I really appreciate it. Okay, it's been my pleasure, Richard. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves, or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.